Hello, Smart Money for Podcast listeners. Welcome to this week's show. My name is Kirk Chisholm, and I'll be your host. So today, I'm joined with Boris Dorfman. How are you doing today, Boris? Good, good. How are you, Kirk? Good, good. We were trying wanted to mix it up a little bit this week, uh, talk about one of our favorite whipping boys of an asset class. Uh, Boris, why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your background? So I run a real estate bet fund in California. I've been in business for 20 years. We started in 2003 as a mortgage brokerage, and we evolved into a lending institution. Uh, We do everything real estate, uh, mostly California, but also uh, nationwide. That's my, mostly my expertise. Okay. So when it comes to lending institution, what does that mean? You lend to residential buyers, commercial, what, what's your thing? Uh, so we're a private lender. We lend on commercial property, on commercial loans only. So residential and commercial, but uh, only for investors. Okay. Bas- so- basically, whenever the banks don't have time or... Uh, products that's one we come in with expensive capital so are you are you primarily just i guess for the listener's sake are you is it just kind of like a typical mortgage or are you just lending money or there's is there some complexity to it or how does that work uh there's actually simplicity to it uh, uh we it does look like a regular mortgage but for a short period of time these these are bridge loans to get you from point A to point B uh, to bridge between the time you can go to the bank or for there's a lot of fix and flippers out there, developers uh, to give them the money uh, to get their project uh, stabilized uh, and to exit with a bank financing or the sale. So can you define bridge lending for me? Because people may not be familiar with the term. Uh, sure. So bridge. Uh, so there's bank financing. It takes time. It takes qualifications, uh, tax returns, and uh, especially now it's becoming more and more difficult. Uh, we are the guys that will look at equity in a property, and uh, will uh, for the most part that's what uh, we give financing on. So bridge means. Uh, You have a long-term strategy and then you have a short-term strategy. Uh, Bridge is to take care of your today's needs. I need to buy a property. I'm on contract for 10 days. The bank doesn't have uh, ability to close in 10 days and the seller will not wait for 30, 40, 90 days for the bank to uh, give you an approval. So people come in, we need the money uh, and... uh, uh, it's also called asset-based equity lending. You're buying a million dollar apartment building. You're putting half a million dollars of down payment. Uh, we come in, we give you half a million at higher interest rate, uh, within a week, give or take. So it brings up the question. I mean, it sounds like it's a lucrative thing to do. Um, but first of all, what happens if they can't get long-term financing? So every transaction that we do, we ask ask for exit strategy. How, Mr. Borrower, Mrs. Borrower, are you going to pay us off? And your two uh, evident uh, exit strategies are sale. Uh, I'm buying a property. I'll put it in the kitchen. I'll list it for sale, right? So that's your exit strategy. One, two is I'm going to go to the bank. And I'm going to get uh, long-term financing. Uh, if they cannot do that, they will be in default or we will work with them. Uh, but like I mentioned before, we don't work with consumers. We work with experienced investors only. These guys, they can pivot on the spot fairly quickly. And uh, we also understand where uh, we need to be more flexible and Let's say today the banks are not lending uh, like they used to a year or two ago. So we are more flexible. We give them a loan for a year, 18 months. Uh, Their exit strategy didn't work out for one reason or another. 
we'll give them an extension. As long as they pay, as long as they keep their obligations. So it brings up the question, I mean, traditionally banks have been doing this. So why are banks, I mean, why do you exist? Like, why aren't banks doing this? This seems like a no brainer. So traditionally, uh, at least in the past 30 years, uh, the banks, they, they have certain underwriting guidelines. Uh, they need to see your tax returns. They need to jump through a few hoops. And by design, that process is never short. Uh, it takes time to underwrite a file. And uh, so there's some time restrictions. And also there's some property, the bank will not land on the property with no kitchen, for example. Uh, and also on commercial properties, the banks are looking for certain ratios. We have uh, rent control in California. There's a lot of properties with tenants that are sitting there for 30 years, for example, paying, uh, you know, a quarter of the market rent. When you go to the bank, the bank says, okay, so your payment is going to be this. Uh, uh, your income coming in is that. Uh, we did our numbers. We're going to give you 20% of your purchase price. You're buying for a million. We'll give you 200,000. Uh, we look at, at this differently. Our collateral is real estate. And we understand investors. So, uh, you know, there's experienced guys that, that come in and they say, hey, I'm buying this property for a million bucks. I understand these people have been living there for 30 years. But, uh, you know, we're going to buy them out. And we project that we will be able to buy out half of the tenants for X amount of dollars. So we see the light of the end of the tunnel. We see their exit strategy. We see their expertise. Uh, the banks uh, have been more strict. And after 2008, they became even more strict with the Dodd-Frank Act that uh, uh, on certain uh, products, on certain, even for investors on residential lending, the banks require ability to repay. Uh, so, uh, meaning they have to show the income. But that's really where we come in uh, for those people that are old enough to remember prior to 2008, uh, uh, you know, the Mardi Gras of lending products, uh, no tax returns, no income, no nothing. Uh, that's pretty much what we do now. And uh, private lending has existed always uh, for, again, whether it's for speed, whether it's for qualifications uh, or for any uh, other reasons. The investors, they understand that in a lot of instances, time is more valuable than the interest rate. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think just from my experience, and we do a lot of uh, hard money lending, uh, you know, for short term fix and flippers. And one thing, I mean, that's that certainly always existed because banks, you know, like you said, it, it takes too long for banks to qualify them. Um, what I find interesting is is since the ninja loans, as you as you kind of referred to them, um, since then the banks have gotten really strict, more so that. You can get, you can very easily get a residential loan at, uh, if you have a W-2, but if you're self-employed, if you have a company, even if your company is making $10 million a year, you can't hardly qualify for a residential mortgage. It's, it's gotten, I mean, I know people who are sitting on seven figures in cash and couldn't get a mortgage for 200,000 on a house for their mom because they had ran their own business. I mean, to me, it just seems like the bank's I don't know if the lending standards are just incorrect, but to me, it just seems like there's a there's a big gap in there. So, so how is that being addressed by the market? Well, uh, going back uh, to your point, uh, I think it's it's the regulations mostly. The banks they do have the money; they do want to lend. You know, in the past two months, it changed a little bit with a couple of banks exiting the space, but uh, a lot of it is regulations and. Banks do have target on their back, uh, but uh, the new products are coming in here and there. Uh, uh, the, I think uh, Trump administration addressed a uh, few points in that Frank Act where they relaxed some of the guidelines and the banks came in with what it's called non-QM products, non-qualified mortgages. 
uh, uh, these are essentially sub like subprime products that uh, existed prior to 2008. And then uh, we have uh, hard money guys like us. You mentioned you guys do the same thing sometimes uh, doing short term loans. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, uh, the banks and the larger banks, they always have private banking, but you know, these are for uh, big boys with a lot of deposit. And we did get some of these banks into a pickle. Um, so is that what you meant by how the market addressing uh, the, the lending? Well, no, I mean, so I guess 2008 changed a lot uh, and maybe it should have in many ways as people shouldn't have been getting ninja loans like they were. But um, but at the same point, it seems like there has been a, a gaping hole in the market with what the banks are doing versus what everybody else has to do. So I guess if I think about it this way, um, there there's a need in the, in the marketplace that are not being addressed by the banks. And the banks are finding it less risky to basically buy treasuries than it is to lend. So for them to lend for like, I don't know, like the past 15 years or so, it's it's been it's been really hard to borrow money. A lot of people trying to refinance can't refinance. Like it's just been a challenge for for most people. I don't know how it is in the institutional side. It's, it's probably a little different, but it just seems like the lending standards have changed dramatically and the banks don't seem like they're willing to expand like they were prior to 2008. It seems like they're kind of stuck um, in the same place. So is that due to interest rates or regulations or where do you, where do you see the really the problem stemming from? Well, one, I think it's regulations, uh, especially the bigger institutions, they want to lend. And like you said, uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, there, there always been uh, different kind of products. If you have W2, you have good credit score, you have 3% down payment, you can get an FHA loan, okay? And, but if you're a self-employed, uh, you make ton of money, you have millions of dollars, you cannot get a loan with 50% down payment. Uh, the logic is not there, and it's not so much uh, that the banks don't want to do it, uh, it's uh, part of it has to do with regulation. Part of it, uh, when you look at institutional lending, uh, there is portfolio lending, which means the banks give the loan and keep this loan uh, on their books until it gets paid off in 30 years. And then, uh, but that's not the model for the most banks. The most banks model is to do the loan and to sell it off uh, further to insurance company, to I mean, eventually it ends up in your 401k anyways, uh, through some kind of a bond fund. Uh, but that secondary market where they sell off loans, uh, uh, there's also regulation. Uh, so you, you have Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that buys most residential loans. These guys uh, were pretty much institutional, uh, you know, uh, they're under government control. They used to be quasi-government, uh, used to be independent institutions. Now these are government institutions. And governments, they think uh, our government for the past, God, how many years, I think they've been more political uh, looking at these things uh, from the political standpoint, from uh, electability standpoint, in my opinion, than looking at the economy uh, as a whole and what markets, what people need. So I think there's a big uh, uh, regulation disconnect. So it it kind of brings up a, a question for for me here is looking at the markets now. I mean, you've been in real estate for a while. You you must see the obvious nature of the valuations in real estate. Um, how are you adapting to that? As well as how is the market adapting to that? Because there's such a discrepancy between rates and prices. So, number one, the, uh, I think one thing when everything was a big party and prices were going up, uh, we forgot the main rule of real estate, uh, location, location, main three rules of real estate, location, location, location. So, there was a party everywhere and uh, 
you know, whatever you buy goes up in price. People look at local markets. So one, you really have to look at uh, local markets and local pockets today. Um, uh, there's big cities, there's coastal cities, and also uh, there, there's been a huge uh, rise in uh, vacation real estate during COVID when people couldn't travel overseas. Uh, a lot of vacation areas saw abnormal jump in prices. So one, you have to look at the local nature of real estate. Two, you really have to look at the asset classes. So you have your residential and multifamily. You have industrial, which is extremely strong. You have uh, hotels uh, that are strong in vacation areas, but uh, they're a lot weaker in business areas. Uh, I've been to Cupertino uh, next to Apple headquarters uh, a few weeks ago. I paid for, I paid $120 for a four-star hotel that used to be $500. Apple does not do trainings like they used to. And of course you have office space. So if you look at uh, uh, real estate by asset classes, uh, I think residential is still extremely strong. Uh, we have shortage of housing in California and office space, downtown LA, I think the vacancy rate is 30%. Office space is extremely weak. So uh, location and uh, property types. Uh, so I think, you know, if you want me to uh, forecast, I think residential will still stay strong uh, and there will be some displacement uh, in commercial, especially office. Uh, so what, what, uh, what does that classes. look like for office? Because office has just gotten decimated. So what does that look like? You're saying a 30% vacancy rate. That's enormous for a city like LA. So where, where does it go from here? Yeah. Do some forecasting. Tell me your thoughts. So uh, beyond that, there is another force in play where most of these mortgages are adjustable. They're three, five, seven, ten year adjustable. So somebody sitting there, they're, you know, with a bank loan at three and a half percent, that's adjusting in six months, and it's probably going to double. So that will throw in uh, a curveball as well. So uh, yes, we're waiting for. Uh, office uh, to drop in value uh, but I don't predict a bloodbath you know maybe a healthy 20% correction because for real estate to drop somebody needs to sell it we don't see a lot of uh, you know there's a lot of panic out there but there's no inventory you you know you cannot the prices cannot adjust or drop if there is no inventory if uh, you know if I don't, if I'm not selling my million dollar house, if I'm not tell, uh, testing the market, uh, you're not going to see the price adjustment. So uh, I think we're going to see some commercial uh, because of uh, the rents or, or because the uh, uh, rates are adjusting. Uh, there will be definitely a lot of displacement in real estate market, but I do not see bloodbath in the next few years. Well, it's interesting because you're talking about the adjustable rates. I mean, commercial properties ten, tend to have like a 10-year adjustable. Um, so obviously that's 10 years rolling, not all at once. Uh, but I mean, how does that readjust? I mean, you have 30% vacancies. The, the dynamics of the economy are changed because of COVID in large part. Um, and and the, the the trends around that have changed. People working from home, they're not working from the office as much. And you know, you've got space. Well, if it rolls over, and now you've got a now instead of like a two two and a half percent rate, now it's at six. The numbers don't work anymore for for these these investors. So how do they not sell it? And then I mean, it's just it's just a whole question of like I don't understand how. Maybe you can explain it to me how. How do the prices remain high when people can't afford the new prices? Like buyers, any buyer or change, any sort of change where you have to get a new rate 
you can't afford the new rates. They were this past weekend, it was eight and an eighth percent for a 30 year mortgage. Eight and an <laughs> eighth. It was two and a half a year and a half ago. At a seven and a half, that's a doubling of the monthly payments. Now, obviously, that's not everything. I mean, the 10 years is, is, is not doubled, but but the point is, is it's so much higher. How do people afford that? Like that's what I'm trying to wrap my head around and why why things are not dropping more. So what's going on? So uh, I can think of a few things. One, uh, there's a lot more institutional ownership of real estate, even residential. Prior to 2008, there was absolutely z almost zero institutional ownership of residential real estate, single family homes, condos. Uh, now, a lot of hedge funds, a lot of institutions, they said, okay, we need to, there's money out there. W where do we put the money? So they came they came back with the models where we're going to buy single family homes. There's a lot of startups, uh, open door, they're buying real residential real estate. This was non-existent prior to 2008. Okay. Two, uh, at least in California, the housing, uh, residential housing is not being built fast enough. Uh, and if you look at the commercial, let's say office buildings, right? Uh, if you look at large office building, you and me, we don't know. We don't own a hundred million dollar office buildings in downtown LA, hundreds of millions. So these office buildings are owned by larger funds and there's a number of things they can do with them. One, they can obviously sell, uh, two, uh, they can try to, uh, you know, make things work, write it out. Uh, and three, they can reposition them. You can reposition a class B office building into class A, create a park, uh, a gym, or like we've seen uh, during, I mean, we've been there before. Uh, when dot-com uh, era ended, we had a lot of office space that was converted to residential apartments. Uh, downtown LA never had residential units prior to that. And then we see a lot of office buildings being repositioned. You can hotels, uh, residential, live, work, lofts. So th there's options out there. Uh, if you look at uh, me and you, uh, you know, our rate doubles, you know, we can file a strategic bankruptcy on this project alone. Uh, we can tough it out. We can sell it at a loss. Uh, uh, but a lot of the larger real estate, um, yeah, it's institutional ownership. Uh, they will be selling at a discount, probably off market. That's what the banks have been doing in the past few months. They, uh, they're they short on capital. They need to sell something. And they need to sell it quick. But you don't see these things on the market. And, and you know, few off-market transactions, they don't really move the market. Distressed sales. Uh, unless they're widespread and like in 2008, they don't move the market. And I mean, I'll tell you one more thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, uh, California, if you look at Los Angeles, Los Angeles is the cheapest city in the world. You, we can say uh, it's unaffordable. Uh, we remember how uh, a nurse and an accountant can buy a nice house in California. It became less and less affordable, but uh, uh, it, it, it's not, uh, you know, it doesn't mean everybody should be buying, uh, should be homeowners in, in Los Angeles, in San Francisco. So if you look at the major cities in the world, uh, your Hong Kong's, uh, Paris is London's, Tel Aviv's, uh, LA is a lot cheaper as a city. And I think this trend will continue. How are what metrics are you using to say LA is cheap? By the ones I look at, it's still one of the most expensive. Maybe not comparing to international cities, but I mean, there's so many cities that aren't LA around our country that are much cheaper. So how are you? What metrics are you using to characterize that? I am comparing it to the major world cities because LA was never considered. Uh, LA was never in New York, right? LA never had foreign investors, foreign buyers. And today they do, a lot of people 
from a lot of foreign countries. They buy, uh, they don't even live there. A lot of people from all over the United States, uh, they buy uh, as a second home, as an investment. So I today I think of LA as a global city and the trend will continue and uh, it will get more expensive. Um, so that's really, uh, you know, if you look at LA price per square foot, it's much cheaper than uh, other major global cities. And I think that's where we at today. I mean, residential, it's 70%. The, the house payment would have to be 75% of median income. That's the average right now in LA. That seems extremely expensive. Uh, it does, but even then we have a shortage of housing and we don't have a lot of inventory. And uh, also, if you look at uh, median income, again, this is one of the top cities in uh, in a country. Uh, there's a lot of wealth in it. Uh, there's a lot of self-employed. There's a lot of people from other states, other countries. And also, if you look at uh, people, uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, news of people uh, moving out of California uh, for one reason or another, political, COVID, uh, education. But if you actually break down that statistics, there's uh, uh, LA is just too expensive. Okay, so middle class families, uh, lower income families are moving out and they have amazing quality of life in North Carolina, Tennessee or Texas. But migration of people that come to California, these are people with uh, higher incomes, more wealth, uh, higher education. Uh, you have a lot of uh, jobs in LA. You know, Silicon Valley is yesterday. You know, now uh, LA has uh, Netflix. LA has a uh, ton of Amazon, uh, Apple. You know, you have a lot of high tech meets media companies. And starting salaries of those companies, uh, they're extremely high. You have $80,000 for a receptionist at a good high-tech company. So the incomes are a little bit different. And uh, I'm 45 years old. When I was graduating college, uh, computer programmers, programmers were in demand. Uh, and today you have kids graduating with data science or some genetical engineering, three years out of school, they're making two two $250,000. You know, you blend that into a family of two. Uh, you have some higher income families uh, here today. So where do so, you think, I mean, where do you think things are going? I mean, it, it to me, it just seems like there's always these, these kind of bubble or bubble-ish kind of markets and they never go one direction you know, they always tend to be like a pendulum. They go extreme in one direction, then they go back. You know, the Fed is raising interest rates. That's putting a break on this growth. So where do you think that goes? Where, where, do, you, where do you think the Fed is, is going to be doing from here? And how does that impact markets as a whole? You know, I threw away my crystal ball a few years ago. But um, uh, I think, uh, I mean, eventually, uh, rates uh, will stabilize, will drop, they have to. We have a lot of money that needs to trickle down through the system. So, but uh, I do see within a year, we already see inflation coming down. Uh, our consumer price index readings, uh, producer index readings, they, uh, they came down a bit. Um, the textbook says it takes about six to 12 months for Fed actions to take effect, effect in the markets. Uh, so I think we're in the middle of it. In the middle of it. Uh, their rate hikes have been working. Uh, they're a little bit afraid uh, to start easing now, but uh, I think beginning of next year, uh, they will start dropping uh, interest rates. Um, but un until we get the inventory, and another reason people are not selling, you know, you're sitting there at 3% interest rate. Why would you sell? Yeah, right. Like you're going to sell one place and trade it for another place where you're going to get 7% rate. 
So, but uh, at least in California, we don't have inventory uh, for the next 10 years. So I think residential will continue to be strong. I see your point. Uh, we are in the longest uh, real estate expansion cycle, but, uh, uh, you know, just because we read in the books that uh, this is cyclical industry, the question is always the foundation. Why are the prices uh, should go down? And yes, interest rates are higher. Uh, I think interest rate will come down significantly uh, over the next two years. Uh, but economy is still strong. As long as people are keeping their jobs, until this job market, until people start losing their jobs uh, at a higher rate, uh, I think we're good. I don't see residential market dropping in the next two years. So it's it's an interesting discussion for sure because we have you know. Uh, we have the Fed funds rate, which is five, five and a quarter. And, you know, inflation rate is, it's dropping. And, you know, I would, I would agree. It's probably going to continue to drop for a little bit. It might bounce back, but it's, it's dropping. How do you, how do you drop rates from here? I mean, you, apparently it's not affecting the market. The economy is still strong. The unemployment is still low. So why would you need to drop rates? I think is really the question. I mean, if, if rates aren't doing anything here, then why would you need to drop them? Keep them here. I mean, that's what the Fed wants to do. They they want to devalue the currency and the debt and all that. So why wouldn't they just keep them here? Why do they need to go down? Well, we have not seen uh, effects of uh, latest actions, like I said, uh, six to 12 months, right? So. The trend will continue. The last couple of raises, the markets have not adjusted. Uh, if you're looking at uh, uh, producer price index, I think uh, it comes first. Uh, the producers are adjusting, and then it will trickle down to consumers. So I think the latest reading on the uh, on the inflation, I think it was like 1.9 percent year over year, or 2.9. I don't have my numbers with you, but it was extremely low and it peaked at uh, 12%, peaked at 11.7, I think. So, uh, uh, and uh, you do see, uh, if you walk into Walmart, you do see price reductions, you do see that. And I think in the next few months, uh, you'll see more. Uh, the job market uh, has been extremely resilient, uh, but uh, we'll see, uh, even lower inflation uh, in the next few months, because these numbers, they replace monthly numbers from last year. Uh, the inflation is calculated monthly. Uh, so we know exactly what monthly figures were for May, June, July of last year. So uh, the numbers that are gonna come in May, June, July of this year, if they're lower, we're gonna see lower year over year inflation. So one, we didn't see the entire effect of uh, rate hikes yet. Two, we've seen, uh, uh, you know, we had banks go out of business because uh, because of what Fed did. So I, I think that's, uh, you know, that's pretty telling. So uh, I think, and uh, yes, uh, it, you know, if they're making their decisions uh, politically, partially, uh, you know, we borrow from ourselves, our national debt, we're paying at the current interest rates. So we kind of have to drop uh, the yields eventually, at least for that reason. But economy is not, uh, 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 you know, the, the inflation is not going to be as high as it is today. A few years from now, and we really I think we peaked at 9% on CPI, we're under 5 now. So uh, the effects of rate hikes are working. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could... I mean, you can make that argument uh, whether they're working or not, I think is uh, TBD um, because it's still it's still early. But I guess the question you brought up that I would ask you is because you have a background in the lending industry, um, you know, seeing those banks fail. Do you think there'll be more like, I mean, th those problems that affected those banks seem like, yeah, those are some problems, but I would imagine there's probably a lot more banks with similar problems. So 
What do you think's next? I mean, keeping high rates just means that we're going to end up probably having additional challenges with certain banks. So what are, you, what are your thoughts from what you've seen? Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I think we're going to see more bank failures. And it scares me a little bit in the sense that uh, I don't want to end up with five banks. They're too big to fail. Uh, so that, that's really the problem. The, the problem, you know, part of the reason why, why banks are failing is uh, stupid decisions. Uh, you know, you Silicon Valley Bank, you uh, you lend money on cryptocurrency, you deserve to go on. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, on the flip side, you know, a lot of banks close, close their door because a reporter writes about them, then it goes into the news, and then you have a run on bank. And uh, uh, yeah, you, you you had weak fundamentals, but everything was working. You you met all these uh, reserve requirements. Everything was fine. But uh, this bank may have issues in the next couple of months or years. You know, you put that story out there. That bank is out of business overnight. So that's. So that's a little scary because, you know, I, I like competition. Uh, I don't like the notion of having five uh, big banks out there for, uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't have an answer for that. And uh, raising interest rates will, uh, you know, will continue to strain bank industry. Okay. So as we, as we kind of wrap it up here, Boris, any final thoughts you can leave us with? And then where can people find more about you? Uh, you can Google my name, Boris Dorfman. Uh, I have a YouTube channel. Our company's website is lbccapital.com. Uh, final thoughts. Uh, things are positive. Uh, I would urge people to take more of a longer term perspective. And if yesterday you thought three to five years is longer term, look at it, uh, at least from the investment standpoint, uh, 10 to 20 years, uh, turn off your news, turn off your TV, and all of a sudden just uh, uh, look at your checkbook and look at your pocket and things are not as bad. Uh, I go to a nice restaurant. I see people are driving expensive cars. They go to nice places. Uh, you cannot get reservations. And then you meet with the same people that are sitting there paying $200 per meal. Uh, they turn on the news and then they tell you how uh, shitty things are right here. Things are good. Uh, things will be good. Uh, invest, save. Uh, uh, yeah, watch Money Tree Investing. <laughs> and uh, st stop panicking. No, things right. really are a lot better than people want them to be. Well, I would agree with that. I think things are are better, and I think that's part of the challenge is is there's a disconnect between perception and reality. When people's egg prices go up a hundred percent, and you know, milk and food prices are going up thirty percent in a year, and the safety of CPI at five percent, people just sit there and scratch their head and say, "Not what I'm seeing," you know. So I think it just depends on on which demographic you're in. And I think each demographic certainly has a different uh, perspective on how things are changing. But, uh, but Boris, really appreciate you coming to the show and sharing your wisdom with us. And um, yeah, appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much, Kirk. Thanks for having me. Hey, Doug, did you hear? We're giving away free money. Well, I'll tell you about it in a minute. But before I do, there's a saying in the mining community, well, Precious metals mining, that is. The saying is that if you want the best deals, you have to be in the room. Now, you're probably thinking, what does it mean to be in the room? Well, I'll tell you. Being in the room means that you're on the short list of people who get invited to be a part of the best deals. These are the deals that most investors will never have access to. You mean like IPOs? Nope, IPOs are chump change. Those are for retail investors, small potatoes. That's nothing compared to these deals. These deals would have you salivating to get access to them. Once you know they exist, you will never look at investing the same way again. I almost don't want to even tell you that they exist because it will ruin your thinking of how the investing world really works. 
Now, you might be excited that these deals exist, but you only have access to the deals if you're an insider or in the room, as they call it. Now, as loyal listeners to the show, I'm going to give you a chance to be in the room. Money Tree Investing Podcast has created the Insiders Club. This is a community of our show's members who are loyal listeners of the show and want to get more out of their investing experience. Being a part of the Insiders Club gives you insider status for upcoming events and webinars, discounts, free stuff and books, and influence on the future direction of the show. This is a great opportunity to join us as we expand our content and services. Oh, and did I mention free money? Yes, in the next few weeks, I'll be giving away free money to our members of the Insiders Club as my appreciation for listening to the show. Now, there's no cost to join the Insiders Club. Just go to moneytreepodcast.com forward slash free money today to join the community. That's www.moneytreepodcast.com forward slash free money. I hope to see you in the room. All right. Well, that was a great interview with Boris. Really appreciate him coming on the show. Now we're into the panel portion of our show. We have our very own Barb Freeberg. Hey, Barb. Hi, everybody. Happy to be here. Happy to have you back. It's been a while. Barb's been on vacation, enjoying the uh, enjoying the sun and whatever else she was doing, but uh, wasn't here. So <laughs> glad to have you back. <laughs> glad to be here. Good. And we also have our own, can't speak today. We also have our very own Phil Weiss. Hey, Phil. Hey, Kirk. Happy to be here. Good to see Great. you. Happy to have you back. Well, let's just dive right in. So getting with starting with you, Barb. Uh, I know you've 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 uh bottled up a lot of this uh this information for us. So what were some of your takeaways from the interview? Well, you know, I've been in real estate for at least four decades. And I know I started when at I least. was a baby, but <laughs> um yeah, a commercial, residential, the whole deal, buying, selling, flipping, the whole uh the whole shebang. And interest rates now are, you know, what many people think are high. You know, 6% or so for a mortgage, home mortgage, up from 2% about a year ago, and Vacancies are going crazy in especially the commercial area where we have so many people after the pandemic saying, what, me go back to work in an office? So we're in kind of a tumultuous time. And I know, Kirk, you asked Boris a lot about predicting the future. I don't think we should predict the future. I think we should deal with what's going on now. And the question is, is now a good time to invest in, say, commercial real estate, um, real estate that is not a home, mortgage rates are up, REITs are way, way down in value. So what should we do here? Is real estate still a viable asset classes with uh, mortgage rates higher? And so I think we should talk about that. Okay, great. And uh, Phil, what about you? What are some of your takeaways? So I just want to jump on one thing that Barb just said, the comment about where interest rates are today. I remember when I bought my first house and I got a seven-year arm adjustable rate mortgage. It was at six and three-eighths and I was ecstatic. And, and now because of the fact that you know, we have recency bias, we see that rates were sub 3% and we think that it's so high. It's really not that high in a historical context. But if you're in a situation where you're selling a house and looking to buy a new one, and you need a mortgage, it does have a huge impact because it's a lot more expensive, right? And, and the commercial real estate market, is, you know, that's very different than it was since COVID because we have so many people out there that are now working from home. And so office space is not as in demand as it was. So there's a lot of different things going on in the real estate market. So it is definitely worth discussing the merits of real estate as an asset class for investing at this point. These things have changed. Yeah, no, I think that's a great perspective, Phil. I think um, I'm going to go back to you, Barb. So, you know, I'm curious in your thoughts on this because, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know what kind of real estate you're invested in, but you know, in talking to a lot of people, everyone's talking about how office space is just the last place you want to be right now. And it's a mess and it's just going to get worse. 
Uh, but at the same time, people talk about how there's still opportunity elsewhere. And, you know, I look at this a little differently, but I want to hear your thoughts. So what are your, what are your thoughts on different kinds of real estate? Like, you know, there's public markets, there's private markets, there's different asset classes of real estate. Like what, how should people be thinking about this right now? And there's also another class, which is the mortgage debt. And today there anybody, whether you're an accredited wealthier investor or someone who's just starting out, who wants to get a toehold into real estate, there's a place for you to invest. And first of all, let's go over the choices. You can buy real estate on your own. That requires, and we're talking investment here, that requires a lot of capital. Most of us don't have that. You can invest in a publicly traded REIT, which is a real estate investment trust, and they include a whole universe of broadly diversified to niche. So if you like, um, say, nursing homes and the old people, the boomers, we're, you know, heading there. So maybe you think this is a growing industry. You're going to tap into REITs, uh, um, nursing home REITs or senior living REITs or if you want uh, industrial parks. So the opportunities are very good. Or if you want to invest in, say, commercial apartment buildings, office buildings. So where do I think the opportunity is? I liked what Boris said, be a long-term investor. Don't play, well, you know, I've got to get in this segment or that segment, and this is going to be the, the definite right place to be. Figure out for yourself what portion of your portfolio do you want in real estate? Because I believe regardless of where interest rates are, are at and regardless of the vehicle that you choose, real estate is a very legitimate asset class. And the thing that makes it so appealing is that it is a real asset, whether you buy a REIT or you buy um, you know, a property fix and flip yourself it is a real asset. And I would say if you want to get in, you have to assess the type of investor you are. Do you want something super easy? Just buy a publicly traded REIT. Um, and because interest rates are up a little now and the value of REITs are way down, you might think this is a terrible place, but if you're somewhat of a contrarian investor and you want to buy when assets are out of favor, this might be a better time to get into real estate. When the market settles, interest rates settle into some sort of more stable place, which it will, they're not going to continue to be going up, 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 up for the foreseeable future, you're going to find that the returns will be steady because people have to pay the rent on whatever real estate they're in. So the owners get that rent and the investors are able to capitalize on earning that rent. So I believe spend a little time figuring out how you want to invest in real estate decide how much you want to invest in that. And then regardless of where mortgage rates are, businesses, businesses need a place to do business. If the commercial space is going to go into another use, eventually it'll settle out. And so eventually there will be an equilibrium. So I want to ask you one, one quick follow-up before we go to Phil Barb is, um, you know, there's, you, you can invest in real estate in the public area and, and REITs and home builders and what have you, and you can invest in private real estate, which is, you know, rental property down the street. Do you have a preference? Cause I know you, you have a history of doing both. So what's your preference personally? Well, when, when I was younger, I did the fix and flips and that was fun. It was great, but it's a challenge because you have to buy right. So depending on the market, you have to find a property that is cheap enough that you can make a profit. So that's what I liked at that time. My preference depends on the type of investor you are. 
Some people like the idea of getting their hands into real estate. So you can partner with other people and buy up either in a syndication or a fix and flip yourself if you have a little money for a down payment. My personal preference, this is probably not going to apply to many of you out there. I am a baby boomer. So um, I'm looking for easy now. So I like re REITs. I think they are. A REIT has to pay out 90% of its income every year. So you have the cash flow. Since that is taxed at the ordinary rate, you definitely want to hold that in like a retirement account. I like them. They're simple. They're easy. You can diversify across, you know, many asset classes or one. On the other hand, when asking you know, what do I like? I think if you really want to get into some of the syndications, the promise of very nice returns is very alluring. But don't buy into what someone is selling. You have to do your own due diligence. I'm lazy now. I don't want to do that due diligence. But if you're not and you've got the energy, then you might get a better return there. Yeah, no, a great insight, Barb. Appreciate it. Phil, what about you? What are your what are your some of your thoughts about how people can get involved in real estate right now, considering where the market is? So on the REIT side, I mean, it's a great source of cash flow because as Barb said, they're tax favored investments in a way, because they have at least for them to get their tax favored status, they have to pay out 90% of their income. So that means you're gonna get dividends from them. Generally, they can, they should be in a non-taxable, a tax-deferred portfolio. But if your income is a certain level, you get a deduction because the tax law that we have right now gives a qualified business income deduction for REIT dividends so that you're not going to pay tax on 20% of those dividends. So it's not quite the same as a regular dividend, but it's still going to be a little bit more tax-favored than your ordinary income would be. Generally, I like that. I have a lot of clients that will ask me, I want to say, I want to get into rental properties. I want to start buying rental properties. That's not easy, right? If you want easy, that's not something you want to do because what are you going to do if you don't have somebody that manages that? And if you have somebody managing it, you're going to give away part of your profit, right? You're going to get a call. You can get a call at two o'clock in the morning because a pipe burst or something went wrong. Do you want to be the one to take care of that? So there's a lot of things that come with it, right? People like it because they say, oh, I get a tax break. Yes, you get depreciation and you might get some other expenses. But there's a lot of heartache and a lot of heavy lifting that comes with it. So I'm in Barb's camp as far as taking the easy way out. I'd much rather invest in a REIT than go out there and try and do flipping because you know you don't pick the right property or it's not the right time or the right location. And you think it's you got a great deal and you can't sell it. And now you got capital tied up in it. That's the one thing, right? There's a lot of capital that you need when you go into real estate. It's tied up and you don't make any money while you're taking it to that next level if it's a fix and flip. Right? And if it's a rental property, you got to make sure that the numbers work. Look at what the rental income is. Look at what your cash flow is. Make sure that you're getting a really, you know, a reasonable return. Because if not, it doesn't make sense. And just let somebody else do the heavy lifting and look for a REIT. Great. Well, I appreciate that. Appreciate that insight. So I want to I ask your opinion on this, Barb, because, you know, as I'm looking at here, we're looking at some uh, ETFs here in the public markets. And I'm looking at the um, uh, the spider. One of them is the real estate trust, which is down about 25% from uh, in, in the last year and a half. And then you've got the home builders, which have come up quite a bit this year. Uh, it looks like they're up somewhere close to maybe 60, 65% this in the past uh, nine months, or maybe six, no, about like nine months. And, and really just a bit down from the peak. So there's a big divergence between home builders and real estate. So you know, as people are looking at investing in real estate, um, you know, I'm curious on that aspect, as well as this aspect that I hear from everybody, which is, oh, it's supply and demand, real estate will be fine, it's supply and demand. And yet, the numbers don't add up. So what what are your thoughts? There's, it seems like a lot of people are confused about what's going on with real estate right now. It is confusing, you know, because in a certain way, the numbers don't add up. Prices 
across most of the country are pretty darn high for real estate over, you know, in comparison with historical averages. And as you pointed out, certain REITs, uh, the, the, the general REITs are way down and then you'll find sector REITs that are, have done much better. And so how do I put this? Um, and interest rates have taken a huge shot up. So if you're on a, if you are on a variable mortgage, you're going to find your costs have, have just shot through the roof. Um, so the question is, Kirk, are you asking me, what should I do? How should I make sense of this? Is well, that? It, I mean, the question is, is there's, it's basically that there's, there's confusing data out there and it's hard to discern. So a lot of people are saying, well, it's supply and demand, but you know, as we've talked about in the show, it's not necessarily supply and demand. Um, but just taking those two ETFs as an example, there's a big divergence in what people think is happening and versus what actually is happening. So I'm just I'm just trying to get your opinion because you you as you said you've been doing this for four decades, which makes you what negative twenty in age. Yeah, uh, pretty much. So, yeah. Um, so you know, but if you're doing it four decades, you've been around, you've seen like four decades is like the bull market in in real estate. And if you went back a little bit further than that, you'd, you'd probably have have seen the beginning parts, which are challenging. But I'm just trying to get your perspective on on this confusing real estate market, which we haven't right. really seen in a long time. It is confusing. And um, like Phil said before, you know, he got a 6% mortgage. I remember the day back in the eighties when 6% was so low, we bought a house back then. It was like, that is freaking amazing that we could get a 6% mortgage. So the recency bias of those incredibly low interest rates. I think the public has to look at not the past 10 years when interest rates have been like zero to 2% because that is a huge anomaly. If you look back at 100 years, I don't think there's been many times, I don't have a chart in front of me where, where the market interest rates or the mar mortgage interest rates have been that low. So I think today with the rise in interest rates, the markets are a little crazy and pricing has it typically when interest rates go up, pricing or stabilize or go down. But the reality is today, the level we're at of interest rates, if you look at it on a historical graph is not high it's probably not even at the at the average it's probably still a little below historical averages and so i think time will tell i don't know how it's going to equal out i don't know if obviously supply and demand comes into play for example if you're looking at the office sector there is a tremendous amount of oversupply because the demand is shrinking. Clearly, office property is going down in value. You hear that about buildings that have been sold for a fraction of what they were worth a couple of years ago. Housing prices have not gone down that much. And I think that is a supply and demand factor is that people with low mortgages, they don't want to move. And so there's not a lot for new people to buy. Um, so home builders, because there is the, the sentiment that there are not enough homes for people across the country, well, those have gone up because there is a lot of demand for homes. So you can look at real estate as an overall asset class, or you can look at it in a sector view. Now, all you out there, unless you want to become a real estate expert, I want to dumb it down, or I don't want to say dumb. I want to simplify it. If you have, don't buy real estate because you want to make a quick buck. Okay. That's just like any other investment. That's, that's really tough to do. Look at it as getting in 
to a solid asset class. I don't know, Kirk, how it's going to shake out. I do know eventually we will get back to equilibrium. That's what economics is, is about. Supply and demand does come back into equilibrium, which means prices and demand will find a midpoint. And at that midpoint, um, you know, there'll be enough buyers for the amount of sellers that there are. Right now, we're at a disequilibrium. So what should we do? Well, I think given the interest rates that are higher in the mortgage area, I think it's not a bad time to look at mortgage debt, okay, which is another sector we haven't talked about. And that is there are companies that will enable you to buy mortgage debt, real estate debt. There are also REITs that allow you to buy mortgage debt. And so you'll get higher than, say, a money market or a CD rate in um, investments that offer you the chance to be the bank. So I think that's one way to play it now. Then on the other hand, just buy a diversified read. Or if you want to play the sector game and home builders, you know, you think that's going to continue to go up. Or if you want to get office real estate at a bargain you know, buy it now, waiting for it to, to reverse. Um, so there's not one right answer. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And you you pointed out mortgage debt. So, so Phil, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, you know, we talked a lot about mortgage debt. Um, you know, is that something you've ever looked at? Or what are, your, what are your thoughts on that as an asset class just compared to real estate? So I've looked at it some. I haven't really, it, it's not something I've invested in. There's a lot of things that come in. If you think about 2008, right? That was a scary place to be because of what would happen with mortgages. What happens is they pull mortgages together, right? One thing that you are going to find that's going to happen now is that the cash flows to the way I think of it, are you're not going to have those cash flows as much that come from people paying off their mortgages, right? Because there's two components to how you get paid on mortgage debt. One is the interest and the other is the principal. And so how do you get principal back? Well, part of it's your monthly payment, but then part of it is when you sell your home, that mortgage gets paid early. But if people are holding on to their homes, right, you're not going to get that piece. So you might not have that extra piece of cash flow there. You just have to be careful that you understand what the quality of the debt that they have and, and those type of things is like, like I said, that's what really got people in a lot of trouble back in 08 and 09 when we had the, they were called collateralized mortgage obligations. And you know, they had, they own these pools of mortgages. And the problem was that some of them, you know, the credit of the people that got the mortgages was not up to snuff. Now I will say that when I think about that, I know like the last time I refinanced my house, the things that I had to go through to do it were a lot different than they've been in the past. You know, they've tightened up the standards. some. like, I had to, I told the the mortgage broker that I was dealing with, it felt like he was asking me for more information than my clients do when they decide to work with me. Because it was crazy the amount of stuff. So it's good to know that you know they're do they're doing it what appears to be at least a better job, but you just have it's not gonna, like I said, you're not gonna get that principal piece is not as robust as it was before just because people are not as willing to move. And when I talk to real estate agents about the market, they tell me the biggest problem that they have is they have people that moving into the area, but they can't find a place for them to buy because there's just not enough supply because people are holding on to their homes because they have these low mortgages. Some of them are like, well, I'm going to move, but I got a low mortgage. Maybe I'll turn it into rental property because the math can work on that, right? Because if you've got this two to 3% mortgage, the economics of making your own property into a rental, as long as you can address those issues I talked before about managing it, they can be a little bit better too, but there's just not a, that supply demand at least on the residential side, does seem to be a big concern right now. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think there's there's one aspect I want to bring up. I want to get your both of your thoughts on this is kind of like the buying versus renting aspect, which I, I think, you know, I, I don't talk about it enough, but it's one of those topics that I'm very passionate about because I think the math is very uh, straightforward here, but nobody looks at it. Because nobody wants to rent. Nobody wants to be considered a renter because the stigma of renting versus buying. And 
you know, if you're single and, you know, young, it's one thing, but if you're you got a family and you're married, like people just have this different stigma about it. Like, Oh, you're not successful or you're not this. And, and this, this FOMO or whatever you want to call it. So I, I want to get your thoughts, Barb, because it's, um, I, you know, I've done the math and I, and to me, it, it just seems pretty obvious, but I, I think a lot of people just don't bother uh, for one reason or another. So kind of what are your thoughts on this kind of renting versus buying in an environment like this where real estate, residential real estate is just way too expensive? I think you have to look at it in a discrete time period. So I think long term buying makes sense because you are acquiring equity and you will have ownership in your house eventually. And so you're building an asset. I think short term, it's a definitely a numbers decision. At some points, it is so much cheaper to rent and it doesn't make sense to buy. So I think you have to figure it out. Now, Kirk, I want to flip this back on you, though, because I know you have done the math and you've made these type of decisions. And I want to ask you, what do you think about long term? I know short term, it can be a much smarter de decision to rent than to buy. But I think of someone who's, say, in their 60s or 70s who has been a renter their entire life, and all of a sudden their income is fixed and their rent keeps going up, now they are in a real bind. Yeah, it's it's a great question, Barb. And so I think, like you said, it depends on which stage of life you're in. Um, you know, But if you look at the math, and I did the math, a uh, bunch of years ago, I actually wrote three blog posts on this on my website. So if you want to understand the whole background of this, you can go there. But basically, the essential part is, is if you're looking at higher end homes, it's cheaper to rent than to own. So if you're in, so it was like five years ago, I think I did it or eight years ago, I did this, where um, anything under 750,000 was more cost effective to buy than to rent. And anything above that, it was more, it was cheaper to rent than to own. So if you wanted to live in a $2 million home, and I live in Massachusetts and in my part of the area, that's that's like, I don't know, that's like average. That's it's, it's really ridiculous. But um, but if you wanted to live in a $2 million home, it's cheaper to rent, much cheaper. Um, however, if you're looking for a half million dollar home or less, it's much cheaper to buy. Because what ends up happening is, is the rents, the rents kind of flatten out at a certain level. Or they they don't go down as much, even though the price of the home goes down. But when you go up, the rents don't really go up as much because the demand is less, right? If you're if if you know if you have a three million dollar home and you want to rent it out, there's a very small market of people who will do that. So, realistically, if they they can't get their full price, so if you bought a, a let's say a two million dollar home in Massachusetts and wanted to rent it out, you couldn't. You, then the math wouldn't work. Um, it's mostly for people who don't want to sell it or they don't want to sell it yet or whatever the reason is. And they just want to make extra income off of it, which is why they do it. But it's not like a big market in 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 this area. Now, it might be in certain like beach communities. That'd be a little different. Uh, if you look down in Cape Cod, there's huge communities of wealthy people that that rent out their homes and they make big money on it. That's totally different. I'm talking about like a year long rent. So as as Barb said, one of the challenges is um, at some point, rent keeps going up and you can get priced out. That is certainly a risk. And a way to handle that is to negotiate when you're renting to say like, hey, I want to rent this for the next uh, 10 years, hypothetically, right? Just say you're retired and you want to rent it for 10 years. You could put that in the contract. You could say, hey, I want to, you know, for the next 10 years, it's going to, it's not going to appreciate more than the CPI or whatever marker. Maybe you say it's 3% a year. You just come up with a number. Uh, whatever it is, right? You can lock that in so you can protect yourself from those numbers. Now, that being said, anything, well, as a side note, anything, at least in mass, past seven years is actually a contract and you have to put it in the registry deeds in, in order to lock it in. So that's a little little trick here in, in mass. If you ever had one of those, you want to register it in the registry deeds and it'll, it'll protect you from that. But um, what I do want to point out is that um, there's making there you're making assumptions. So when Mar when Barb asked that question, she's making an assumption. She's making an assumption that inflation is going to be positive uh, for the next ten years, and we don't know that either. 
we all make the assumption that it's going to be, but we don't know, right? So in Japan, the stock market went down for 23 years. They've had deflation for close to 30 or past 30, 33 years. They've had a deflationary environment. So rents, real estate prices and rents have gone down for that period of time. So in some ways, that would be a good thing if they were dropping the rent. I'm not suggesting we're going to have that, but you have to assess all of the different variables. You can't just make assumption, be like, yeah, inflation, it'll be the same, right? As we know, that's not been the case. So you want to take a look at the variables and say, what is the likelihood of deflation? Well, it hasn't happened since, if you exclude the global financial crisis, which I don't really count, it really hasn't happened to like the 50s or really in the early 1900s where it, it was more prevalent. Um, so it's it's not as big of a risk now, but it certainly is a risk that no one is considering. And so if that's the case, then technically they could be dropping rent and that would uh, benefit you. So consider that. But but I would say in general, if you look at the math, um, most people think that real estate buying real estate is an investment. It's not an investment. It is a personal preference. It is a personal choice. It is a um, it's a personal expense. You know, if you if you look at money, you're paying to live somewhere, you're paying it regardless, you're paying someone, you're paying it to rent, you're paying it to the mortgage, um, you're paying it to property taxes. You know, if I think about if I bought the home that I'm in now, I would probably pay more every year, even without a mortgage, than it would be if I'm renting. Because there's property taxes, I have to pay to fix the house every year, you know, roof leaks, uh, lawn maintenance, you know, plowing, you know, whatever, all that stuff costs money. When you rent, you don't have to pay for any of that, right? But when you own, you do. And if something breaks that's expensive, you have to pay for it. Whereas if you're renting, you don't. So there are good and bad. There are pros and cons to each one, right? And I'm not suggesting everybody should rent. I'm just saying that people should at least consider it, right? It's not a good or a bad thing. It totally depends on the numbers. So what I would stipulate is this. If you're looking at moving, right, buying or renting, you should look at the equation this way. Buying is something you should look at and say, this is something that is an emotional decision because the math is the math, right? If you're looking at buying versus renting, you do the numbers. By the way, if you look at our blog post, we have a calculator, which you can actually get for free. Um, and the calculator will help you calculate the different scenarios, rent versus buy. What's it gonna cost to buy? What's it gonna cost to rent? And you know the pros and cons of each. You do the math. My math was basically anything above 750,000, it's better to rent, below is it's better to buy, generally speaking. Um, however, you have to consider what the math is in your situation. Now that's only half the equation because for most people that are married, they have a significant other that has a decision. And many times that decision is part emotional. Like, I really like that tree in the backyard, it has a swing on it. Or I really like the neighborhood because there's kids that are the same age as my kids or whatever the reason, right? And it might be that owning is a better decision for you for one reason or another, right? It could be that you wanna make a significant change to the house, which you can't do if you're renting. It might be because you want to live there forever or it's a legacy home. Various reasons why people might want to buy. I'm not distinguishing whether it's good or bad. That's a personal decision you have to make. My point is, is it's not logic and it's not emotion. It's both. But you can't, dis you, you can't take one without the other. Many people make emotional decisions. I really like this home. It looks nice. Or it, the math doesn't work. It's both. You have to consider both. So... My point is, is um, my decision, and I'll walk through my decision. And I want to give it back to uh, to Barb and Phil. I don't want to take up all the time, but part of my decision came up with the fact that we were moving out of the city because of COVID. We, we couldn't live there anymore because I have young boys and they need to run around, and you know we weren't ready to sell the condo, so we we just found a place to rent, and we love it. We love the neighborhood, love the people, we love the landlords, everything about it. We love it. So we have no really incentive to move. The numbers made more sense than buying. And at some point, um, we may want to buy. And my thinking is real estate's overpriced and it's going to come down. At some level, it's going to come down. And because people just can't afford to pay the same price they're paying. People aren't moving. They're not buying. They're not selling. So there's no, there's, there's no inventory rollover because people can't afford to. So at some point, that's going to find equilibrium. And maybe that just takes time. But at some point it happens and I'm prepared to wait. 
for that time for finding that that home that I really want to own. Because if I buy, my vision is it has to be a legacy home. It has to be something that I love that I don't want to sell ever. And I want to stay here indefinitely. Because if I'm going to move in five years, why am I going to bother buying? Financially, I'm just lighting money on fire. So for me, I would rather just rent for those period and then find a, a permanent home. So that's that's kind of my thought press of how I went about it. I'm not talking about emotional. This is just strictly, you know, financial is the math just didn't make sense to to buy something and move in a few years. So, you know, we're still figuring it out, but that's a part of the process that everybody needs to make. You need to go through it. You need to go through each step. You know, why do I own? Why do I want to rent? Why do I want to live here? Do I want to live here for a long time? Like, you know, like my kids are going to college at some stage, we'll retire at some stage, where do we want to be? All of those questions are important to me. It's not just, hey, we have to move somewhere. Where is that going to be? That is short-term thinking. And that's how you make bad financial decisions is what is happening to me today? You have to look out 5, 10, 20 years and try to think about where are we going to be? Why are we going to be there? And make sure you're making a good decision, right? And don't do not do it just because I have to move and I have to find a house to move to. And so I have to roll it somewhere. Don't don't let that be the dis- deciding factor. Make sure that it's a well thought out decision. Make sure you include renting versus buying because it's, you know, it is an option, right? So just, just something to think about. Uh, like I said, none of these decisions are easy for anybody, but I, I certainly don't want to own two homes at the same time. That would not be fun. Uh, so, um, but yeah, so let's, uh, as we get close to wrapping up here, um, Phil, final thoughts from you. Thanks, Kirk. So one thing that I want to highlight that you talked about just now is how long are you going to be there? Because there's so many expenses that are involved in moving. Now, I'm in Maryland and we pay real estate transfer taxes when you sell your house, in addition to paying the real estate commissions and the moving costs and everything else. So if you're going someplace and you don't think you're going to be there that long, that makes buying financially make a lot less sense because you got to factor those costs in too. And then from a financial perspective, right now, you know, if you have your mortgage and you're at a nice low rate, it's nice to know that that payment's fixed, right? But if you rent, you might have some increases, but you also don't have to pick up all those other expenses that Kirk talked about. Something goes wrong, it's not your responsibility. And something too to think about for retirees when you're thinking about moving, you might not know the area before you decide to buy, even if that's where you're going to end up, rent someplace first. Maybe it's go to Airbnb or something like that and get a house, experience the neighborhood, make sure that's where you want to be. Because the last thing you want to do is retire. And then a year later say, oh, I'm too far from my old friends, or I'm too far from my family, or I really don't like this neighborhood. And now you got to pick up and move again. So again, you want to think about all those things. It isn't that there's emotions in this decision, there's finances, but don't let, be careful about letting your emotions overrule the finances, because if you do, it can have harm in other ways. Where where can people find more about you, Phil? So my firm is Apprise Wealth Management. ApprizeWealth.com is my website. You can go down there. If you go ApprizeWealth.com slash ebook, you can download my free ebook. You can also sign up for my weekly blog. Thanks for having me, Kirk. Thanks for coming on, Phil. And Barb, final thoughts from you. Investment markets go up and down. That goes for real estate, it goes for stocks, it goes for special asset classes. Unless you are a freaking financial genius who can perfectly choose the bottom and the top, your best strategy for investing is decide on the asset classes you want to be invested in and set your investment strategy maybe have a little bit of extra for fun to switch it up 5%. But basically realize investing is not a game. It's a strategy to turn today's dollars into a lot more dollars tomorrow and just stick with it. Realize some of your sectors are going to go up and some are going to go down. But in the long run, Stocks have earned very nice returns. Real estate has earned very nice returns. You've gotten cash flow from these asset classes. And today, bonds and cash are also paying in the 5% return rate. So be patient. Don't just hop around from investment to investment. Educate yourself. 
I'm Barbara Friedberg. You can find me on YouTube at Barbara Friedberg Personal Finance and at Robo Advisor Pros. See you next time. Great. Thanks for coming on, Barb. And uh, Barb, Barb, Barb mentioned the people who are geniuses who can pick the top and the bottom. We call those liars. So <laughs> <laughs> um, no, nobody can do that consistently. That's the show for this week. Thank you again for joining us on Money Tree Investing Podcast. My name is Kirk Chisholm, Wealth Manager of Innovative Advisor Group. We don't just manage your wealth, we make your life better. You can find more about me at InnovativeWealth.com. And of course, you can find me every week here on this show. You can also check out our show at Money Tree Investing Podcast. On our website, you'll have access to the show notes, resources, and the archive shows. Please remember to subscribe on our YouTube channel for immediate access to the new shows when they're released. When you subscribe to the show, it allows us to get access to some of the top minds of investing in personal finance. While you're here, please leave a comment and question if you want us to address it on the show. Have a great week ahead. And remember, no one will care about your money like you do. So invest in your life.